So today I'd like to talk about Old School Essentials, which is turning this into these. Hey everybody, Jordan here, the page is silent, and this is Old School Essentials. This is a, and I'm trying to get this right, it is a reimagining of or a or a retelling of the original BX and advanced fantasy rules of Dungeons and Dragons. They took those rules, clarified things, updated certain things for a modern audience and uh, basically made the game more accessible to people that have never played it before because original uh, basic expert and advanced D&D was complicated and you had a uh, descending armor class and a lot of things that are counterintuitive to RPGs now, or I should say uh, fantasy based RPGs like this. Uh, they're hardback. They're really well, just great quality. And like you've got, I don't know, the, the information's really laid out. I actually filmed this whole video yesterday. And then as I was watching it, I realized I wasn't talking about why it's important or why I like it. I just kind of did a flip through. So that's more of what I want to touch on. If you're interested in playing retro fantasy based RPGs, the old school Renaissance movement, the OSR movement is huge and there's tons of them out there. You can find all kinds of OSR stuff. So why old school essentials? Like why pick this up? And I've talked to a few people where I was like, you should try this. It's really awesome. And they have come back and said, you know, I'm kind of, I'm good on OSR content because I play X, Y, and Z. And it's like, oh, you're right. They're all similar, but not necessarily the same. And so far, I think Old School Essentials is my favorite go-to for a retro feel. Let's discuss. So I went to the Old School Essentials Facebook group, and I just put in a little uh, question that I was like, hey, I'm making a video about OSC. Why why does this grab you? Why does it stand out? And I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Some of the people were saying the art, which the art is really fun. Um, it's very uh, like retro and fun. I don't know. Uh, the modules are great. The quality of just the books in general are really fun. They have really great layout and the information is accessible. I read a lot of RPG books and I have been uh, in the past year because I kind of am on this kick of like, I want to write my own RPG. And the more I read, it gets to a point with certain authors that the information is very good, but their layout is kind of off in a way where it probably makes a lot of sense with their uh, brain as they're writing, but connecting the dots later on for somebody who's brand new to this can be uh, a little discouraging and, and push people away from the game or the hobby. And it's weird to think about this with an RPG, but I think your books need a user interface. Uh, programmers program specifically to make things accessible, and you're not programming, you, you can't go to your, uh, your customers and be like, well, you need to learn better on how to use this. Uh, customers need to have an intuitive sense on how to use it. Uh, and, and I think RPGs are similar. With Old School Essentials, taking all of that basic expert D&D information and clarifying it, making it accessible. Um, the layout is really awesome. You can go through, you can find uh, monster stat blocks really easy. Players understand exactly what they get at certain levels. Uh, there is learning with any new game but it doesn't feel as daunting or confusing as it might have been with uh, 1980s Dungeons & Dragons. So as always, I like to show the physical books whenever I can because I am a collector and I enjoy physical products, uh, but when we're actually going through this, we're gonna highlight certain things about this. Uh, it's easier just to show you the PDFs. And again, if you're interested, there are links. Yeah, so if you're interested, uh, I'll put links down below. This is the ones that I got, but if you search old school essential, well, I searched advanced fantasy, but if you search this, you'll find that there's lots of stuff because they had little booklets. Um, but if you want what I am currently talking about, it is the old school essentials, advanced referees tome and players tome. Uh, right here, they're $15. Uh, you can also go to Necrotic Gnome's website and they have bundles here that you can get PDFs and I think physical books, I'm not really sure. 
But anyway, we have two books, the player's tome that has all of your player options and the referee's tome, which has uh, referee options, dungeon master options, magic items, things like that. Now, I don't necessarily want to go through and teach you how to play uh, old school essentials or just BX d and in general. Uh, there are a lot of the base rules and then optional rules that kind of quality of life made the game a little bit better, in my opinion. Uh, but you can always play those original rules and then change the ones you want for whatever optional rules you enjoy. And if you're really interested in this, there is a uh, actual play that I did with my friends. So you can watch that and kind of see how the game is played, point out all the rules that we got wrong because it was the first time that I actually ran an old school essentials game. So, uh, you know, you get a feel for how the game should run, but if you've played any version of Dungeons and Dragons, I think you'll be fine. One thing that I will point out is that in Basic Expert D&D, your character class and race were the same thing. So that means that you could be uh, a cleric or you could be a elf or a gnome, but you couldn't necessarily be a gnome cleric. If you were a gnome, you leveled up as a gnome and you had gnome-like abilities. And if you were a cleric, you were human. You were a human cleric and you leveled up as having cleric abilities. That changed with advanced fantasy. So if you look over here on character classes, we have acrobat, assassin, barbarian, bard, cleric, drow, duergar, dwarf, elf, fighter. And that's because I can level up as a dwarf. But moving over to character races, it shows all of these different races. So with the advanced uh, package on top of this, that's why I have advanced fantasy, uh, you can be a halfling cleric instead of leveling up just as a halfling. In my actual play, we followed the character class slash race. So we had some drow that were playing as a drow leveling up through the drow charts. So first of all, we have the acrobat. And if you look over here, they have levels one to 14. After level 14, you don't really get better. Um, so there you go, you've kind of maxed out. But if you look at the experience, uh, you start out at zero and then you go to 1200. As you level up, your saving throws go up um, and you have your acrobat skills that you get better at. This particular uh, character class, you uh, have a D100 that you're rolling under uh, whatever you're good at. And that can be a little confusing, but let's look at uh, CS, which is Climb Sheer Surfaces. So at level one, I have an 87% chance of success. And if I keep that in my mind, that that 87 means I have a chance of success. When I roll my percentile die, I want to get an 87 or below, which means that I have achieved that, that bracket of 87% success. Something that has helped me understand how it works. So here we are with the drow. The drow only have 10 levels, but if you look, they actually, like I have to get, uh, it's 4,000 experience to get to level two. So if we're playing in a group party, our acrobat is gonna level a lot faster than our drow. Our acrobat is probably gonna have more hit points than our drow. And it's, that's different and fun and interesting. And I, I, there is something to be said about everybody leveling up at the same time. It's a lot of fun. We look at each other like, what did you get? What did you get? But this progression is more dynamic and interesting to me where everybody is kind of different and uh, they level up in a different way because you're learning at different rates. I don't know. It's just little things like that that I really enjoy. Um, the drow as a demi-human class has um, certain combat with armors. You can find secret doors and things like that. But you also get some divine magic because of your affinity for the spider queen. Uh, this is just some really cool art that I want to showcase. <laughs> Again, the art in this is so fun. Uh, we also had a duogar in our party, if you watch the, the actual play. And uh, let's just take a minute to look at like how this is laid out. Like, I don't know, it's a two page fold, obviously, but this isn't separated on, on like this page isn't on 45 and then I have to turn the page to get to duogar level progression. Like everything I need to know about being a duogar is right here. And I think that is just really, great design. There's no flipping pages. There's no bookmarks. There's no trying to be like, oh, that's right. I have to go over here. Like everything you need is right here. Minus the spells, which they can't just pack everything in there. But we know that we go to a spell and look it up. Gnomes. Gnomes have arcane magic. So you can cast uh, certain spells. You usually uh, do illusionist spells if you're following like a and d, d tradition. So I wanted to take a brief moment to talk about encumbrance because there's uh, basic encumbrance and then there's detailed encumbrance. 
but weight is not tracked by uh, actual pounds. It's tracked by the weight in coins because so much of this is going to be, you find 10,000 gold pieces. Well, how many coins can your characters physically carry? And so because of that, we have coin weight. So if we look over here, our uh, dagger is 10 coins in weight, but our uh, short sword is 30 coins in weight. And then you get into armor and the plate mail is 500 coins in weight. So there's a there's that burden and there's that idea of like so if we get in here how do we get everything out and how do we how do we gain all of this uh gold as experience in a way and then magic and uh, magical research and you'll recognize a lot of the spells that are in here uh bless find traps hold person so it's very uh because of the open game license we're using a lot of the same spells from original D D. so you'll you'll recognize these and know how they work Jumping over to the referee's tome, just to highlight some things that I really enjoyed. I wanted to talk specifically about monsters, but this was just a really good read. Uh, it really broke down like what is advanced fantasy, why play it. Uh, the you know right from the get go, like hey, these are streamlined rules found in the tradition of the 1980s basic expert sets. Like we loved the simplicity um, and the robustness of it, so we repackaged it in this in this great book. From the get-go with monsters, we break down what all of our, our uh, uh, acronyms mean. So armor class AC, uh, movement rate MV, so we know really quickly. But then look at some of these monster stats. Let's find one that's uh, fun here. Um, bugbear. So there's a bugbear. Uh, you, you understand what it is. It's a large hairy goblin with an ungainly uh, gait. <laughs> Favor attacking by surprise. So you as the as the referee or the dungeon master, you can look at this and say, okay, uh, I the monster is going to behave a certain way. Uh, they want to attack by surprise. They're not going to just be out wandering around. Um, everything in brackets after here is for ascending armor class. So if we do, if we played traditional D&D, your AC of five, uh, we talk about Thacko to hit AC zero means that uh, if I have a Thacko of 19, I have to roll a 19 to hit somebody who has an AC of zero. Um, I've never enjoyed Thacko, but luckily they put uh, in brackets next to the AC what it would be if they were ascending armor class. So right now I know that this has a creature has an AC of 14. So I have to roll a 14 or higher with my attack in order to hit this monster. Hit die is three plus one, or you can just say it's got 14 uh, hit points. They have one attack, which is a weapon, uh, and they do 2d4, or they do a weapon plus one. So if this is a uh, bugbear that has no weapons, um, or if you give them a specific weapon. So if they have a spear, then you're going to do a d10 plus one. Their two hit AC zero is 16, but what does that really mean when we're trying to attack? Well, it's a plus three to attack. So roll a d20 and add plus three. I just feel it's very concise and easy to read. I like these monster stat blocks a lot. <laughs> so with dragons, I wanted to talk about really quick is that uh, some of them, it, it, it made sense to me, but I also had to go back and kind of reread this. So I wanted to point it out. Uh, if we look at like the black dragon right here, um, so there, let's just look at their stat block before we decide to read all of this, which is what I did. So AC 17, hit die, we've got 31 hit points, uh, two claw attacks and a bite attack, or they can do their breath. They've got a plus six to attack. All of that makes sense. But down here it says breath weapon, uh, a 60 foot long line of acid. Okay. Uh, language and spells. There's a 20% chance for four first level spells. And there's a 40% chance they're sleeping. What? So I went back and I was first confused. Well, yes, you have a breath weapon, but it didn't say how much damage it does. Well, looking over here, breath weapons can be used up to three times per day. And this is for all dragons. Uh, unless noted otherwise, anyone caught in the area suffers damage equal to the dragon's current hit points. So there's a saving throw for these breath weapons, uh, save versus breath weapon, because dragons were so prevalent back in the day. Um, so if I have 31 hit points and right off the get go, I use a line of acid, I'm going to hit everyone in that line of acid. They have to roll a save. They're going to take 31 hit points or 15 hit points, depending on uh, the current hit points of this black dragon. 
Um, going over here to sleeping, there's always a chance that a dragon is sleeping. Like you walk into their lair and they're asleep. Again, the dungeon master can change this, but I, I like it. So uh, you come upon a sleeping dragon. Well, we know there's a 40% chance that he's sleeping, uh, but some dragons do pretend to be asleep. A lot of classic monsters in here. Here's the lich, living statue. Vampires here, uh, very, they were a lot scarier back in earlier editions with uh, the energy drain. So when you get an energy drain, you lose experience levels. So you were losing levels that you had gained. So fighting a vampire could be very scary. Um, and when you lose all of your levels, so if you're back to being a level one character, uh, a person drained of all of those levels became a vampire in three days. And so as you're being drained of this, you're also uh, losing hit dice and it can be very scary, which really changes the game as a whole. Like if you know that that's a possibility, you're going to avoid vampires. You're you're not necessarily going to run out. And then thinking about this and think about Strahd in Ravenloft, that was a very different adventure from the fifth edition Curse of Strahd. When you think about this, like that vampire could just destroy you and all the work that you've put into your character. Dungeon encounter by levels one to three. So I can roll a D4 and a D10 to come up with all of these different numbers that uh, tell me what I find. I find a bugbear or I find a, a lizard, a gecko. Uh, and then treasures and magic items. There are some great tables to roll magic items, but I also want to talk about, uh, there was like intelligent magic items. And you'll recognize a lot of these as well from uh, older D&D or even current D&D. Sentient swords. So there's a whole bunch of tables on creating uh, magic and weapons, but there was a whole area here of how to create a sentient sword and what does it do and what's its alignment and is it going to work with you? Is it going to be cursed in a way? What kind of extra powers does it have? Uh, lots of interesting stuff. So that's that's it, guys. That's old school essentials. Uh, I, I, I guess I talked a little bit more about it than I thought I was going to, but I really like this book. I really like this game. I would like to play longer versions of it. Uh, it has, I don't know why, I just have become obsessed with retro RPGs in a way. I like the design and the simplicity of it. I really like it. I think it's a lot of fun. If you want to pick it up, uh, good luck finding a hard copy. They might be there on Exalted Funeral. I'm not really sure. If you're interested in how this plays and our wacky initiative that we were trying to figure out, you can watch the pl uh, actual play, which I'll put a link somewhere, uh, probably down below in the description. Uh, also links to Drive Through RPG if you want to pick up this yourself. Those are affiliate links. They help me out a little bit if you're interested. Uh, and yeah. I don't know, what do you, what's your favorite thing about Old School Essentials? And tell me all about your games and what you're doing and getting people excited for this, uh, this system. Um, something that I didn't talk about is the adventures that I got with it. Uh, I've read through this one and I've read most of this one. They're really cool, the art is a lot of fun, and maybe that's a separate video where I kind of talk about these adventures and uh, playing them and running them and just how they're laid out. Again, the design, very good with this, these Necrotic Gnome products. Thank you again for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't uh, and tell your friends about the channel and I will see you guys all in the next video. Thank you so much.